shall we give an appreciation to our worship team today? Okay. That was really good. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing how, I think when we were praying, we had this five minutes time before uh, to pray, you know, like before the service starts. And I, I reckon when I was like briefing the team about, you know, like today's service, I was telling them, you know what, let's pray for, for the people. You know, like people come from different backgrounds and contexts. You know, some of you probably had a bad week at work, right? You know, like, and you're like, oh, you know, like can't wait for the week to be over. Okay, it's a long weekend, and so like this, it's, it's time to rejoice. Some of you are coming from, yeah, you know, like family situations, you know, like, you know, we, we don't pretend that, you know, our families are perfect. If your family is like really perfect, then yay, way to go, you know, but, but, but it, it, it doesn't happen always, you know, there are, there are conflicts happening within families. And then, of course, you know, like with the way you serve, you know, some of you are like very much involved in church, and you're like, oh, wow, this is just too much for me. But we come here because of God. We come here because of the hospitality of God. The reason why you are here is because you are responding to the love of God. You may not know it, but you are drawn to be here in this community. Do you believe that, brothers and sisters? Because in here, you will encounter the presence of God, not just through the singing, not, not just through the words, but through the faithful witness of the community of faith. And that's why, you know, that's, that's, that's our part, to make everyone feel welcome and to make everyone, um, you know, like, feel um, the presence of God through you. Today we shall be continuing with part three. Again, if you're a visitor, this is part three of a series that we're doing. Um, you know, like, we did it like two weeks ago, um, taken from uh, a passage in Ephesians um, entitled, Living as Children of Light. And um, it's from Ephesians chapter 4, 17 to 5, 21, but we're going to do um, the last bit um, today, and this is the conclusion of our message. Okay, let's begin. <laughs> Are you familiar with this movie? Stardust! Have you read the, the novel? Read it. It's very good. It's fantasy, you know. Um, this was made in 2007, so probably some of you were not born yet. <laughs> but anyway, it's a classic. Google it. Look, at, look, look it up. It's, it's, it's a very good film. Um, some years ago, um, this, this movie was made. It starred um, Robert De Niro, you know, Michelle Pfeiffer, and then, of course, Claire Danes and, and Charlie Cox. I don't know if they're still active in the movies. Um, but Claire Danes, she has a television show, right? Um, a hit show um, on TV. What was that? Home. Is it Homeland? Yeah, so it's, it's something. But you don't watch American <laughs> series, I reckon. Um, and this is a mythical th uh, tale of love about the hopeless romantic simpleton, which is uh, played by Charlie Cox. Tristan is his name. And he stumbled upon a shooting star. Okay? Let me repeat that. This guy, this hopeless romantic guy, stumbled upon a shooting star. Now, what you would normally expect to be a meteor, a piece of rock coming from the sky, voila, she, she happened to be a woman, you know? So she's, a, <laughs> she's a star incarnate, you know? Like, um, yeah. Um, the thing is, this star is pretty special because when she lands on Earth, a lot of witches will be looking for her because you know what? what, what, what what's the connection between the witches and, and this um, shooting star? Um, basically, the witches would need to eat her heart. <laughs> That's really gross, right? So that they can continue to be beautiful and young. Is that my phone? Hello, hello. <laughs> but anyway, so that's, that's uh, the, yeah, that's Michelle Pfeiffer, and, and they made her really look ugly, but, but still very good, right? And I mean, she still looks good for, for, for an old lady, you know? <laughs> now, the thing is, we're going to use um, the name of the, the shooting stars, Evane, okay? Claire Dane's character is called Evane. Come in, you're welcome. If you want to join us for, yeah, <laughs> for worship, it's, it's good. Yep, you can stay for a while. Give it a try. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, welcome. Awesome. There you go. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for coming. Are, are you visiting Sydney? 
Yes, thank you for coming to church, you know, like on your way to the bay. <laughs> thank you. Okay, as I was saying, we're talking about, okay, this is a sermon, but yeah, we're talking about the movie Stardust. <laughs> well, it won't come back. The PA doesn't want to, but anyway. Um, yeah, so um, there you go. Last week, we used, we used the Little Mermaid as an illustration to... <laughs> I think I, I, need, I, need, I need some towers here. There. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll just say next slide, please. If it becomes irritating, though, um, a little bit. I'm using Evane as the point of the um, illustration for today's talk. Um, this is ta- the, these um, pictures are taken from the movie Stardust, and we're talking about this meteor, the shooting star girl, came from heaven and who sought after by witches so that they could eat her heart so that they can become young but we're not we're not focusing on that we're focusing on how this body you know this heavenly body there you go even when she's filled with much love and joy what happens to her she glows you know she has like she's bioluminescent i think if if you would put it in scientific terms right now so when she's in love she literally glows, and that's the catch of the film. When she falls in love with Tristan, everyone would take notice of her because she literally radiates. She radiates, you know, um, and everyone could, everyone could see her. Now, remember we said that to live as a child of the light, you need to be transformed, right? And last week we said you need to embody But the realization of us being children of light takes place when we actually shine for God. Hence, you know, the reference to to Evane, because she definitely radiates. Now, the thing is, that's a challenge for all of us Christians. Are we shining for God? Could you try to look at your seatmates and do you see the glory of Jesus on their faces? Beautiful people, right? You're not convinced, but anyway. <laughs> you know, that's, 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 that is the, the, ultimate, the ultimate purpose of us being believers in the Lord Jesus Christ is really for us to shine for God. And if you don't get the idea, the song that we sang, the really long song by Matt Redman, which I specifically chose for, for this um, service, if you look at the, into the words, you're talking about like what, supernovas and everything? We need to shine for God. Now, in Ephesians 5, 7 to 14, we have the last installment of our comparisons of black and white. The black and white series is basically, you know, putting side by side the things that we shouldn't be doing and the things that we should be doing once we have a personal relationship with God. The Apostle Paul begins with a strong warning, do not be partners with them and he's talking about the gentiles he's talking about the non-believers do not be partners with them but let me ask you the question is it possible for us not to have any strong association with anyone who's not a believer you know like for someone i mean we are believers in jesus but what about the rest when you go to your workplace not everyone's christian there when you go to your school not everyone is a Christian there. I remember my kid, and she was um, studying in a, in, in a public school in, in, in Melbourne. And she comes home, and, 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 and that's Ain, okay? That's why I don't want Ain to be here, because Ain is always an illustration, right? <laughs> um, Ain would tell us that, you know what, Dad, I'm the only Christian in my school, and, and, and I find it difficult, you know? But when we move here to Sydney, and she attended St. George Christian School, and she came home, and she's like, you know what? I think everyone's a Christian, you know, and I need to step up my game, you know. Then there you go. You know, that's, that's how it is. It's quite difficult, but we cannot avoid people who are not Christians because that's a very sad thing. Come to think of it, when I became a pastor, when I started serving in ministry, my engagement with non-believers has probably shrunk to what? Almost zero. And that's really sad. Because how can I share the gospel to those people who need it most when all I mingle with are actually believers, right? So it's a plus and minus. Plus because it gives you strength as a believer to mingle around Christians a lot. But if, you, if we become like what? Hermits. If we become islands. If we become like people who live in a bubble, we don't really engage with people outside. 
So, so that's, that's the biggest challenge. But when, but when the Apostle Paul said, do not be partners with them, I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 15. Are you familiar with this passage? It's used a lot by pastors, you know, like when, when you're discussing boy-girl relationship and about dating. And I have a full sermon on this, so we're not going to discuss that. But to make the long story short, according to um, a lot of times, it's being used as, um, you know, like our engagement with the non-believer. It's like, do not be unequally yoked with non-believers. That's, that's what they say, you know, like you shouldn't be tied together with them. And the usual application is basically marriage, right? Okay, so we have, I, I found this on the internet. It's like, according to the Bible, which impending marriage does God counsel against? You know, Christian, Christian, non-Christian, Christian, non-Christian, Christian. You know, so it's like, did you even get that? But anyway, <laughs> so um, my take on this is a, a, a bit of a shallow, um, you know, exegesis of the passage because it's not just actually talking about partnership. But a lot of pastors will pound you on that. Go back. Do not be an equal leader. Don't date, don't date a non-Christian. And I'm not. I'm not encouraging our young people to date someone of a different faith. But come to think of it, if you use this formula, is there a guarantee that these marriages will work anyway? Whether it's like Christian, Christian, non-Christian, 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 Christian. No. Because come to think of it, the highest rates of divorce actually are from those people who have married fellow believers in Christ, and that's really sad, right? So it's not a formula. And what the passage in Corinthians is talking about is basically compromise, okay? You can be a Christian, you can mingle with the world, but do not compromise. That's the point, and that's the point of the Ephesians passage. See, before we were in darkness, but now we are in the light, right? Can you tell that to your seatmates now? Say, bro, sis, you are in the light. <gasps> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, one time, I, I, you know, I, I do a lot of crazy stuff. I'm, by the way, I'm a new pastor here, so I can do a lot of these things, right? Maybe one time we're not going to have a message, right? We're just going to have a conversation. Let's just chat. Let's just talk to each other. Let's just mingle and engage and know our stories, you know? So we were in darkness, but now we are in the light. And that is the expectation of someone who has a personal relationship with Jesus. Oops. Before the things that we do are fruitless deeds of darkness, the stuff that doesn't please God, but now that we are in the light, we exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Again, let's recite it. Galatians 5.22. Love, peace, See, it's very important for us. Do you hate memorizing scriptures in Sunday school? Do you, do, you know, like when, when your Bible teacher says, like, come on, memory verse for the week. In my time, we do that. They, they write it in like, in like a chalk. There's no whiteboard, right? I mean, a chalkboard. So they write the passage. For example, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And then the teacher erases four. And then we, we recite it again. And then the teacher erases like the word love. And then until, by the end of it, we have memorized the passage. You know why it's very important for us to memorize scriptures? It comes in handy. Now, when you are in trouble, you hang on to the word. Boom, it comes back to you, right? And like this, I don't need to, to do a massive exposition of what the fruit of the light is because goodness, righteousness, and truth are basically part of the things that are produced in us as we have a personal relationship with God. Next one. There. And before we hide in darkness, but now we are exposed to light. Now, this is very important, brothers and sisters, because the more we grow closer to God, the more of himself is revealed to us, but at the same time, the more of our impurities are exposed to the light. And that's the most horrifying thing, I reckon, for Christians, is to come out. Okay, don't get me wrong about coming out. It's a different thing, you know. It's basically to just come out in the open and be vulnerable in the community. A lot of times, I've talked about this last Sunday, we come to church and we put on a mask. We put on a mask. It's about time you get that mask off. 
I'm not saying that, you know, like you clean your dirty laundry in the church lest it becomes a subject of gossip. No. But you come to church clean. You come to church as, this is me. I don't have anything to hide. You don't need to know everything about me, but I am like you. I am not perfect. Yes? Who is perfect here? Could you please raise your hand? Is there anyone who's perfect? I'm going to give you an award. I'm going to give you a medal, you know? And I'm going to send you to the next perfect church so that that perfect church can be imperfect and stained, (laughs) you know? Right? Do, Do you get that? The more we see of God, the more of ourselves are revealed, you know, and, 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 and it gets exposed. And we don't like that because we hang on to our, our old selves. You know, we don't want to be changed by God. But, but, but that's the basic expectation of someone who is in the light. We don't hide anymore. We don't hide anymore, right? Before we were unwise, of course, the opposite of that is like you are wise. What is wisdom? Is there anyone here who could define the word wisdom? What's the difference between wisdom and knowledge, brothers and sisters? Yes? Applied knowledge. That's my wife, yeah? (laughs) Applied knowledge or knowledge that's put in good use. All the stuff that is in here is nothing if you're not able to apply it. And I reckon that's the challenge of a lot of churches. We know a lot. But what do you do at the time when you need it most? And that's why I said, the memory verses come at the time when you need it. You know, like, oh, really, I'm really sad. What do I do? Well, the joy of the Lord is your strength, right, sister? You know? Oh, what? I am sick. You know, God is our healer, right? You know, all of that things. You know, like, if, if, if it stays in your head then that is being unwise, really, because you're not able to apply the knowledge and put it into good use. And as believers in Christ, that's what is expected of us. The things that you have learned from Sunday school, from youth group, from your Bible studies, it needs to be applied. And when it is applied, then we can finally say you are wise. Yes? So it's not only those who have, um, you know, like, studied and those who have, there you go. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, like, not, not only those who have PhDs and, you know, like, um, masters are entitled to have wisdom. Actually, a lot of times, you know, those who went to, to Bible school, when you bring them to pastoral ministry, you know, like, they have, like, years and years of theological training. When conflict arises in church, they're the first ones to crumble. Because they don't know what to do, you know, because they don't really know what to do. Before, you were foolish, but now you had the capacity to have an understanding. So this is very, very straightforward, black and white, black and white. And then the apostle comes in and he said, for anything that becomes visible is light. And therefore it says, wake up, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine in you. Why is it that as You know, he's saying, okay, this is something wrong and this is not to be done. All of a sudden, boom, you know, the Apostle Paul comes up with this. A passage that's probably taken from Isaiah. You know, arise, shine, for the light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. A lot of biblical scholars would say this. Well, it's an evangelistic message within the discourse to talk to those who do not have a personal relationship with Christ so that they will come alive Um, in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what? As I was meditating upon this passage, this is not really for those non-believers. Come to think of it, what's the context of the, 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 the Ephesians epistle? It's the local church, right? It's for the church. So it's not even an evangelistic encouragement for someone to arise, you know, and, and, and have the light of Christ. No, it's not. It's for us. It's for those who have been in church for a long time those who are feeling desperation, those who are feeling like, whoa, I am in church for years, but I am dead. I have been following you, Jesus, but I I am not really growing. That is for us, for us who are like uncertain about what's going to happen, for us who feel like, oh, you know, like the world is falling apart. 
what is the significance or, of, of my faith in here? Come, come, come inside, please. Yes. Let's just give them a time to. Thank you. Thank you for, for coming to church. Maybe the challenge for our congregation is to fill up the spaces in front first, right? But you know what? Every church does that. Every pastor would say, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> so that we, we can reserve the, the, the last bits to the people who see. But, but you came a little bit later. That's, that's, your <laughs> that's your privilege to sit in front. Thank you so much for coming. This is Central Baptist Church. If you're here for the first time, we welcome you here. And we're just talking about Ephesians, okay? So we were saying that the, urge, the, the urging of the apostle for someone to like, okay, wake up! Wake up and receive the light of God in your life. It's not just for those who do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but, but actually for us, for us believers. Okay? Brothers and sisters, to live as a child of the light without shining is a very great tra tragedy. It's like a salt losing, losing out its taste. No longer good for anything except to be thrown out and be, to be trampled by men. See? You may have experienced transformation, when you become born again in Jesus, you may have attempted at embodying that faith, you know, by, by trying to exhibit change. But if you don't shine for Jesus, that is really nothing. That's really nothing. It will, it, you're not fulfilling the purpose of why God has called, called you. Now, he moves on again. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit of God. Remember, previously we said there's, there's an urging for us not to grieve the Holy Spirit, right? The, the Holy Spirit grieves when we do bad things. You know, when He's convicting us to change and we don't change, when He's trying to tell us, don't do this anymore, don't touch that, don't click that button. You know, in the computers, you know, don't click, but you still click. Don't go that way, but your foot walks that direction. Don't say anything, but you're like, no, I have to express this. Boom! You know, and then you, you hurt someone um, in the process. But this time, the urging is to be filled by the Spirit of God. To be filled by the, by the Spirit of God for what purpose, brothers and sisters? In the next passage, it says, addressing one another as you are as you're filled by the Spirit of God. Let's read this together. One, two, three, go. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay. As we are filled by the Holy Spirit, we have the capacity to respond to God in worship and to submit to one another in reverence. And the practical application of this, again, is in the context of the local church. How do we worship and how do we fellowship with one another? Are you still following through? Again, going back to the passage, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs out of thanksgiving. In the Colossians passage that we studied at Getaway, the bottom line there is what? Out of thanksgiving. I mentioned that, the worship wars that happened in the church. Church is splitting up because of different difference in tastes, in music. One camp would want to sing hymns, another one would want to sing contemporary songs. It's sad. It's sad. Why? Because according to the passage, we can sing together as we are filled by the Spirit of God. Now, if we bicker, if we fight because of the genre of the songs, then the Spirit is grieved, right? Right? The Spirit is grieved because we cannot even get together. But for the passage that we had read in, 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 in Ephesians, other than Thanksgiving, I said the bottom line there is out of reverence for, for Christ. Out of reverence for you know, revering each other in Christ. And that's, that's how it is. And this is a challenge for us. Central Baptist Church, international congregation. Our congregation is at a crossroads. We're not just international, we're intergenerational as well. We have young people. We have young adults. We have young couples. We have couples with children, with young children. And then we have our seniors. How do we get along? What's the bottom line? Have reverence for one another because it will melt out any of the differences that we have. If we become international, see, that's the biggest challenge. That's why I said let's be church first. You know, because if we cannot get our act together as an intergenerational church, 
in terms of the way we do worship, and in terms of the way we fellowship with one another, how do we expect to attract the world to come here? Together with our own different cultures and their different ways. Still, we are still very much monocultural here, brothers and sisters. You know, there's still a lot of Asians in this congregation. But the vision for this church is to bring the world out here. You know, people from every tongue, every tribe, every nation, worshiping together. But before we become international, let's focus on being intergenerational church first. Let's get along regardless of our ages. Young people, don't just stay there. Mix up with the older folks. Older folks, don't just wait for the young people to come to you. Go to them and have an engagement and interaction. That's how it is. If, because if we cannot be intergenerational, we will never be international. Because when the internationals come, we'll not just be talking about hymns and contemporary songs. We'll be talking about world music, right? Right. Won't we give them that space to play their ethnic instruments here? And everyone's like, oh no, that is pagan. No, that's music. Right? See, that's just a thing. So the practical application of shining for God I'm not even talking about witnessing outside. It, it begins here. The Ephesians text is within the context of the local church, brothers and sisters. So that's the challenge for us, to shine for God. Are you up for it? <laughs> yes? We are doing great. We are doing great. More people after the service are like engaging one another. More people are like reaching out to each other. But it, we, we need to do more. We need to be more intentional. And again, we hear the baby cry, singing praises to the Lord. Yes. And we're okay with that. We're cool with that. Okay? I'm going to talk to a man that's like, when, when Izzy's fidgety, we love her. You know, like, she's fine with us. You know, she, she can stay with us here. Okay. Now, brothers and sisters, what is the challenge for us? As a child of the light, a child of the light is transformed. A child of the light embodies, embodies what it is to be a child of God. And then a child of the light shines for God. Oops. <laughs> it's supposed to be black background there. Okay. So the, the process of transformation is this. So you, you get transformed, you embody, and then you shine. Can we say this together? One, two, three, go. So they can, you can, if there's three points that you need to memorize, this is it. Transform, embody, shine. And that's the process that we need to go through. We trans, we're transformed by the blood of Jesus, Brother, you're welcome to join us. Yep. Yay. Nice to see you, bro. Yay. <laughs> and we should embody and we should shine for God. If there, the quest is for us to have a genuine, a genuine transformation in God. And it was spelled out. This is a summary of, of the Ephesians passage. There. Remember your identity before and after, before you're a Gentile, um, you know, like you're worldly, you're immoral, you know. Um, if, if there's no genuine transformation, right, basically, brothers and sisters, you're just a nominal Christian for that matter. You know, you can be in church, you can be attending church, but there's, there's nothing that happened in your heart. There's no transformation there. You're nothing but someone who is just part of the church, but actually is not a born-again believer in Christ. <coughs> Sorry about that. Have you seen the, the, the secret life of Walter Mitty? It's something like that. You know, like you have your own world that you're living in. And a lot of us are like that. You know, we have a secret life as a nominal Christian. <clears throat> and people don't know that. But it's between you and God. It's between you and God. Now, if there, the quest is for us to have a real embodiment like Ariel, the little mermaid. She wanted to be a full human. We need to be a genuine believer 
um, in Christ. If there's no real embodiment, you know, all of these things that I've shown you last time, you know, the things that you shouldn't do and the things that you, you are supposed to do, if you are not able to do that and there's no real embodiment, you're basically a worldly Christian, okay? And we're trying to identify that. You're, it's, it's, that's that's, that's, that's how, how it is. Now, in terms of us shining for God, <coughs> if we are not shining for the Lord, in terms of our worship, in terms of our fellowship here, we're just playing church. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, where do you belong? Hopefully you're not a nominal. Hopefully you're not worldly. And hopefully you're not here because you're just playing church. Now how do we change? We need to die. We simply just need to die. If you've been here in this church for like 20 years, it's no guarantee that you're actually shining for God because maybe along the way, you know, like you're just here because of your parents. Someone just brought you here. And you find yourself serving. You're, you find yourself doing all of these things. But you haven't experienced the born-again experience, you know, that comes from knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Let's just take this moment for a while to think about that. Where are you, brothers and sisters? Are we just playing church? Are we being worldly? Or are we just, we just have the tag? Yes, I'm part of Central Baptist Church, but that is as far as it goes. So this morning, brothers and sisters, as we partake of the communion, this is something that we're going to do. In the getaway, we did stuff, you know, like every message that was given, there is a response given to everyone. Oh my God, my throat. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, but right now, there's one thing that I would like to offer for, for each and every one of you. And maybe I could come down. <clears throat> and that is to look inside your heart. Where are you? Do you have Jesus? Do you think you have the Lord Jesus? Or you just believe that you have the Lord Jesus, but actually he's not there. Maybe you have been in church for so long, but you haven't experienced the joy of receiving the Lord fully in your heart. Yes, you're cruising along, but you're not sure that if something happens to you, <clears throat> you will be with God. Brothers and sisters, we need to be born again. And belonging to an organization doesn't mean that you are. Belonging to a body, attending, showing up, we do appreciate that. But you need to come into terms with your spirituality. Am I really a child of God? Is he really the Lord of my life? Is he really at the throne of my heart? Am I submitting to his lordship? Because a lot of people are willing to receive Jesus as their savior, but they're not willing to make him lord. And being a Christian is about that. It's committing to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's committing to his will. It's submitting to whatever he says in his scripture, in the Bible. And that is the Christian life. And if you don't have that, brothers and sisters, I'm going to take this time. Let's settle this once and for all. You know, so that you're not unsure. So that you have something to hold on to. As we sing the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. I would like you to think of the story of this one man who came to the world 2,000 years ago and who gave his life so that each and every one of us 
could be forgiven, so all the past will be forgotten, and so that we will have a new chance. If you want to have that, brothers and sisters, what does it give you? It gives you love. It gives you a family. It doesn't just give you heaven, but it gives you a life here on earth. A life that knowing that every step of the way, there is someone with you who will never leave you nor forsake you, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He died, he was crucified, and he gave his life for each and every one of you. And so, as we meditate upon the words of this song, think of your life, brothers and sisters. Where are you? Are you just playing church? Are you just someone who shows up because, okay, I have the Christian tag, I'm in, I'm a member. Or are you a Christian but half of your body is still in the world, wallowing in sin day by day? It's about time that you make a resolve and say, God, I am not going to do this. I'm sick and tired of this. I'm not saying that you're going to be perfect, but it's entrusting your life to Jesus and saying, God, I'm, I, I really want you in my life right now. So let us be in the presence of God and let us sing the song that talks about the love of the Father in us. <clears throat> and talk to Jesus right now. Please. How deep the Father's love 